when the game plays the player, we're going to start with a little bit of story time. You see, me and Scott, we're old. We went to the Rochester Institute of Technology. The nerdiest school on earth. Yeah, it is pretty nerdy because it snows all the time. All the dorms are connected with tunnels, so you don't have to go outside. They have two OC3s. Well, they had two OC3s many years ago. In what the do they have now? I don't even know. Well, whatever. It's crazy so, fast internet. A young Rim, who surprisingly <laughs> looks a lot older back then than he does now, and a young Scott in a pirate hat, Lived in a humble apartment on RIT's campus. You can see the CRTs. There were no cell phones back then. It was, they were dark ages. One day, I saw the stupidest thing I'd ever seen in my life. At the Anime Club social night, right? Which I don't even know how I ended up at it. Um, we were in the Anime Club. They had a social night, which is play games all night with everybody. You know, and it rolls over to the next day, right? So... We go there, and I'm, I had a D&D &D, you know, game scheduled, so we sort of stole a room near the social night and played D&D, &D. and when I came back, Rim was stomping on this freaking yeah. thing. Yeah, so we'd seen this thing around, it looked stupid. We were like, that's stupid, why would anyone do this? Look at how lame yeah, this is. Yeah, power well. pads sucked. I mean, it's cool, but it's like, you wouldn't actually play power pad. So Scott right? goes off to play Dungeons and & Dragons, and I go off, and I'm like, you know what? I really want to hate on this thing. So I'm going to play this and tell everyone how stupid it is. Right, so, I mean, you can't knock it if you haven't tried it. Of course, a lot of people on the internet disagree, but I don't. So when I want to hate on something, I don't say anything about it, and then I try it, and then I hate on it. That's my strategy. So, so four hours later, Scott comes back, and I'm, of course, still playing this really terrible, stupid game. And I see him make, making himself look like a moron, and I'm like, I will never do that in my life. And he's like, you have to try it. And I'm like, I guess I have to try it so I can make fun of it, yes. Uh, so uh, so let's, I try it. So let's skip it ahead a little bit. So this is a mod chip for a PlayStation 1. I bought a PS1 that year for the sole purpose of playing Dance Dance Revolution in my own apartment. In fact, Dance Dance Revolution wasn't even available in the US, so I needed a mod chip. And I had to get the games somehow. They weren't even easy to import. This was a day before you could just download stuff. Well, you could download stuff. I mean, Napster had died, but there were other methods, especially on an RIT campus. Uh, but there was no pie, BitTorrent didn't exist. So I bought a PlayStation 1 without ever even turning it on. I cracked it open, soldered this thing into it, went to Red Octane, and said, I want Dance Dance Revolution. Now Red Octane, you guys know them from their more recent uh, games. How many people know who Red Octane is? Oh, okay. okay, people actually know. Red Octane was basically the Netflix of video games before Netflix even really existed a lot. Now what they really were is you would get a PlayStation 1 disc of an import game, copy it with your $400 CD burner, and play it on your mod chip PlayStation. Now it's worth noting that in the entire time that I owned that PlayStation, only one non-Dance Dance Revolution game was ever put into this thing. That was a ISO of Mega Man Legends I downloaded just to see if I'd broken it after I started the mod chip in. I think I played G. Darius on it once. The point there is that this game looks really stupid. And it really, actually, was one of the greatest games we'd ever played at the shore in Wildwood, New Jersey. This is back the in most the disgusting place. Like, middle 2000s when Dance Dance Revolution and arcades were still like going really strong. There were like 20 DDR machines on this boardwalk in Jersey. And we would dance there, and there would be crowds of people watching. There'd be this really crazy community. That actually is us in Wildwood. As of this year, there are no DDR machines in Wildwood. Not one. There's, I think there was one pump it up machine. And one broken in the groove machine. Okay. So we started thinking about this, that no one really talks about Dance Dance Revolution in the modern era of game design. And in fact, the only time it came up and what kind of inspired us to do this panel was at the last two packs ago. It was, a, it was a few packs ago, and there's some panel, I don't know if they still have it here, where they get a bunch of game journalists, and they have like a ranking of like best 10 games, and like each journalist can make like one move on the list. So they'd be like, I would add Counter-Strike, because it was the first game like that ever, which wasn't true, oh, but that, that's what they said. And uh, what's his name, Chris Hecker, the spy party guy, I think, yep. he goes up and he's like, DDR number four, and me and Rim are like, yeah! <laughs> and everyone else is like, boo! And we're like, there's a problem here, right? If we're the, if me, Rim, and Chris Hecker are the only smart people in this room full of game journalists <laughs> and gamers, let's try to fix this with a 20 minute panel. Now we're not saying DDR is the best game ever. It's not, it's not a perfect game, but people don't no. talk about it. And I realized something very important. Or respect. Thinking about this, <laughs> is that I was looking through my own life of games that were really important to me, that like really influenced me as a player, as a designer, as a guy who talks shit about games in front of people at conventions, and one, I noticed that I really like the sequels to things. Doom 2, Quake 2, Civ 2, Tribes 2. But two, DDR two. 
came into my life about the same time that Counter-Strike did. And what did I play right before I got on the plane to PAX? Counter-Strike. What is, to this day, the most popular game on Steam? Counter-Strike. So DDR, I've been playing just as long, and yet I've never lectured on it. I've never talked about it. I never even really analyzed it, other than I got really good at it as a player. And that's not our thing. We like to analyze stuff. So we started and decided to talk about this. So Dance Dance Revolution, the game just plays you. I mean, if you're not familiar with it, I'll skip a slide for a second. It's just a machine with arrows, and you follow what the arrows do. All right, now see, when you, if you actually start playing DDR, you've just started, you've never played it before, you're looking at the arrows, and your conscious brain is trying to say, there's an up arrow, step on the up. There's a right arrow, step on the right. But once you're good at it, you're, there's no conscious thought, right? It's the arrows just go by, and your legs just move. <laughs> and it's like, if some person was controlling which arrows showed up, it's like they'd be controlling your legs like you're a puppet. <laughs> The game is playing you. Once you're trained in the art of DDR, the game plays you, and it's simply a matter of how well are you trained, how fast are your legs, how big are your lungs, can you play the expert game, or will you break it because you're a crappy puppet? <laughs> so what is it about DDR? We're going to talk about DDR like it's special. It's not special, it's just that we want to... Fourth really, Mix Plus is special. We want to really dive deep on this one game and really talk about why it's different from other kinds of rhythm games. Now, DDR was one of many Bimani games. This is a very rough timeline because actually it was all long enough ago in the late 90s that I couldn't find reliably accurate actual release dates for all these games. Yeah, all you have conflicting information all over the place. All you have to really know is that Konami has a series of games called Bimani, which is named Bimani because it was Beat Mania, was sort of the first one mostly, right? Now, Beat Mania is a sort of pretend you're a DJ game. And right around the same time, they had Poppin' Music, which is pretend, well, we'll talk about Poppin' Music. <laughs> uh, guitar Freaks, which was this crazy idea that you could have a fake guitar and play along with the music in the 90s. I, I feel like a game came out again. I feel like there's also been sort of games like, you know, Beat Mania have come out also. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there was also Keyboard Freaks, or uh, Keyboard Mania, I forget what it was called. Drum Mania? Drum Mania. So yeah, uh, Rock Band seems to have come out a long time ago. Now, the really interesting thing, all those arcade machines, so this guitar game, this keyboard game, this drum game, these are physical arcade machines. You could connect them all together, and Rock Band really existed. Like, for real, it was designed to do that in the 90s. So DDR came out of that, but DDR is sort of conceit. Like, its basic premise was that you were dancing on a stage. You have four arrows. Now, look at the design of this machine. Let's think about it from a psychological perspective. It's imposing. It's big. It definitely, it, it has a stage that is separate from the actual machine itself. So it basically makes sure that there is kind of a space around it. Yeah, when you, area. When you have so a Galaga machine or like a Ms. Pac-Man machine, it stands up and it's a self-contained thing. It doesn't spill out into the arcade in front of it, right? So you can walk past it and avoid it. When there's a DDR machine, it's like, Every, it's like grabbing you with its big pad-like arms and metal bars, right? In addition to that, right, if you notice at the top of the machine, next to the sort of, you know, big thing that says DDR, there's freaking stage lights that blink and flash out all over the place like you're actually at a club or on a stage. It's got these huge speakers, which aren't actually that powerful. The pro people at the good arcades would plug in tiny little speakers that were a thousand times better, but those things look really big. The game is also constantly making noise. You know, all arcade machines have the sort of attention getter eye catch. It's like, hey, come play my game, make a loud noise and scare a kid. Well, the eye catch on this game was actually arrows going by, showing you how to play the game. Now, what's interesting is that you can just get up on the stage without putting a quarter in and follow those arrows. You can play DDR on the pad without ever putting a quarter in. It wouldn't register your score. You wouldn't get to finish a song. The music wouldn't really be playing along with the arrows, but you could see the arrows and you could stand on the pad all you wanted if you weren't, you know, if no one else was playing and sort of try it out. See what it was like to stand up there. You know, and you go up to a Pac-Man machine, it's sort of, you can see what it's like to move the joystick. Okay. <laughs> in fact, a lot of times I would play because I was a poor punk college kid. Someone would put a quarter in to play solo on one of these two pads, and I would just kind of get up there and do the dance next to him. He wouldn't get a score, but he still, you know, he could look at the left side arrows, and you get yeah. sort of a free play. So if you look at the game itself, it is just arrows. It's just saying up, down, left, right. But there's a lot of subtlety and design going on here. For one, these arrows, you can see it looks like they're all different colors. They're actually not. They're all the same color but they're shifting, they're scintillating through a series of colors based on what beat they're on, so they're always the same color when they get to the top. So you can, at a glance, see the flow of quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, all the craziness. 
In addition, these arrows at the top, they show you where you're, when you're supposed to step. When the arrow hits the top, you step on that arrow. Those arrows pulse with the beat of the music. Everything pulses. These combos, as you're getting a combo, that little perfect just keeps going like pulse, pulse, pulse. When getting you step bigger, on the bigger, up, and bigger yeah. and bigger until the dude says 100 combo and then you screw up and you lose. Right. It. When you step on the up arrow, the up arrow at the top of the screen gets big at the same time. So you can make that get big at the same time as the arrow in front of it is in front of it. It's like, like you're eating the, the arrow that's approaching. Now look what else is going on here. You'll notice that there's a score, and the scores are fairly similar. But one of these guys is playing in basic mode, and the other one's playing on a more difficult mode. They're not dancing to the same arrows, but to the same song. One of the most interesting game mechanics of DDR that is very rarely replicated is that it's two players simultaneous on a screen, and yet two players can have completely different difficulty levels. I, I consider myself an expert DDR player. I'm super good because, you know, 10 years, you better be good at a game by then. 12 years. I'm 12 years and still can't play Counter-Strike. All right. <laughs> I, I can play DDR with any of you on the same song, the same pad, and you will get a different set of arrows. They'll stick to the same music, and we'll just play just fine. We'll still compete. We'll both feel like we're contributing. If I fail the song and the game's going to end, you can keep me going and vice versa. So the game really, really encourages you to play with other people even if there's no possible way for you to compete on a direct skill level. Does Counter-Strike do that? No, well Counter-Strike you're going against someone, so your difficulty is set by who the other guy is, right? In DDR you're both sort of playing against the computer or against your, you're, you're, you're playing against yourself. Can you do it? But I am playing against you as well because I'm trying to get a higher score. Yep. And if you are on easy mode and you, you know, do better and you do perfect on easy mode and I sort of fail at hard mode, you will have a higher score than me. That's just how it works. So another really interesting thing about this game is that they rated all the songs. Now this radar came later, but the game has always had this concept of feet. As in, you have a foot rating for a song, and this foot rating tells you how difficult the song is to play. I don't know who in Konami designed this rating or actually danced these songs. But you can tell they designed it after a jukebox, right? And that's sort of also the design of the machine. Is like you go in and you select your music and you're spinning through the songs and you know pick. You get to hear this a preview of the song when you stop on it for a little while, and then you can pick it out if you like it. And they added also, you know, the radar he was talking about, which tells you what kind of difficult the song is. But even before that, these foot ratings, the differences between a three foot, four foot, five foot were very, very well engineered and very well designed. The game taught you how to play in a way that very few games do. It sort of intuitively draws you, like in a, in a basic song with like four feet. It's all just quarter notes, but every now and then there's like one eighth note. You go to the next level, and there'll be like a few eighth notes here and there, and the game just like progressively gets more difficult, but in this very, very controlled fashion. Much like how in a Mega Man game, they show you an obstacle and give you kind of an easy way to get around it, and then later the same obstacle comes and it's much more difficult, but it's not a surprise. I've seen it before. I saw that purple arrow the first time, I'm like, what the hell, and I missed it. And I was like, oh, I guess it's a quarter note. And then when there were two of them, I was able to step on it. So Mega Man and DDR share a lot in terms of the way they teach you how to play themselves. The stage itself is super high quality and metal. If I had time, we'd show you some videos of people who, you know, they don't play for the perfect score. They play to not fail the song, and they dance. They dance really well. This used to be a big thing at conventions like about a decade ago. And the fact that the, you know, they engineered it such that like all the arrows were at the same level as the metal around them. It wasn't like they were recessed or sticking out and you had to click them inwards, right? It's just, you were just dancing on a floor. It just so happened that a few of the floor tiles were sort of magical floor tiles. And it sort of reminds you of like, you know, walking down the street and trying to like step in between the cracks, right? Only some of the tiles, you know, it's almost like an Indiana Jones situation. You don't want to set the trap off, only you do. Yep. Now, an interesting kind of aside is that in uh, like HCI, Human uh, Interface Design with Computers, that whole like field of study, there's that even affordance, meaning if something in your design, you, it will afford someone who's interacting with your design certain capabilities, whether or not you intend them to have them or not. If I make a glass bus stop, one affordance of that is that I can smash the glass. If I make a wooden one in instead, one affordance is that I can spray paint on the wood. In DDR, they had this bar on the back of the machine. It was designed so you wouldn't fall off the machine and hurt yourself. But some players would grab onto this thing in order to look like a doofus. <laughs> so it's sort of a case study there in that if you're ever designing a game, your players might use the elements that you introduce into the game for situations that you might not have anticipated or for reasons you never would have expected or wanted. 
and you don't want anyone looking like a doofus. So let's compare DDR to a couple of other games, because this is where the differences and what's interesting about DDR really stand out. Let's tell a tale about a man oh, we know. All right, so Poppin' Music is a rhythm game where there are, I think, seven or eight buttons, maybe even nine. There's a whole bunch of big There's buttons, nine. right? You, you hit them, right? And basically, there's little lines going up the screen, a lot like Rock Band or whatever, and you just have to hit the buttons. That's all you do is hit the buttons. You stand there, and you go... Tick -tick 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 -tick. It came out slightly before Dance Dance Revolution. It's one of these Bimani games. Yeah, and you, you hit them sort of in rhythm with the music, and the, they orchestrate you know, where the lines show up to go with whatever song it happens to be. And there's been a lot of versions of Poppin' Music. They still bring one out every year, like clockwork in Japan. It's sort of crazy. So we're at Katsukon one time, and Katsukon, unlike PAX, has an all-night game room. 24-7. You just stay in there at 3 a.m., still gaming. And it was arcade, so we gaming. had arcade machines in this room. All right. Someone had set up a poppin' music in the corner, and this one guy really liked it for some reason. He was also really good at it, which made you think he had it at home. Why was he wasting his time at Katsukon playing it? Especially when no one was around at 3 in the morning. Uh, but he just played poppin' music literally nonstop, all night, never ending. He smelled really bad. <laughs> oh, boy. It's like, what is this guy doing? And we, we just really wanted that guy to go away. And he did not go away the whole con. And the next much. year, we're standing there, we're like, is that the same guy? It was totally the same guy. At the same pop. Just came machine. back to Katsukon for another year to play pop and music again. I was like, all right, you guys, someone has to switch that game out with something else. So, pop and music to that guy was just as important as DDR is to us. Yet, I think pop and music is dumb as a person. I don't like pop and music. That guy clearly had no interest in playing DDR because there was a DDR machine there, too. What are the differences between pop music and DDR? One, DDR analogizes a real world thing. You are at least nominally dancing if this is what you think dancing is. <laughs> Some people are actually dancing when they play DDR. Some people aren't playing DDR or dancing. I don't know what they're doing. But at least there is an analogy. Pop and music, the analogy is not even there. You are just hitting buttons. It, there is not even, at least DJ Hero or you know Beat Mania, it's like, okay, you think you're being a DJ. Some, I guess there is some DJ equipment that maybe looks like that. There's a little turntable, right? This is not analogous to anything in the real world. It's not even a plastic guitar. It's just plastic. Now it is still a game of very high skill. I tried to play pop and music, it's hard and that pause. guy creamed me. And the thing is, let's talk about this from a spectator perspective. People would gather around in Wildwood, New Jersey, like I showed before, and watch someone playing DDR. Most of those people had never seen DDR before, or if they had, they didn't know anything about it. DDR was a spectator sport to experts who would be looking at the feet of the players and watching what they were doing. And also looking at the screen of the arrows. And it was a spectator sport to people who didn't understand what DDR was. The game itself was a spectacle. Kind of like how even if you don't understand anything that's going on in hockey, you can understand a fist fight. <laughs> but if you go over there and you watch the League of Legends, you don't know how that game works, everyone in the whole room is going to go, oh, like they did a few minutes ago. And you're just going to be like, what happened, guy? What? So poppin' music is an amazing spectator sport if you are a poppin' music dude. But DDR is a spectator sport to anyone. So what about this kind of more recent genre of rhythm games? I like to call them the touch and drag genre. Now these are not spectator sports. No one's gonna watch you on your iPad going like this. Except creepy dude. <laughs> <laughs> They also don't analogize anything. Now, they can be fun games, and they can trigger other elements. For example, the nostalgia version of this genre. A lot of people love this game, even though it's really not much different from this, which is really not much different from this. <laughs> they are rhythm games. We're not saying they're not. We're not trying to pull some sort of no true scotch. Yeah, you have to not. push buttons to a rhythm or do something you know, in time to a beat. That's a rhythm game. Right? There's not much you can say about it. But if you want to set, talk about rhythm games, I mean, look at FPSs. How different is Planet Side from Counter Strike, from Quake One, from Deus Ex? FPSs are this completely amazing range of things. Yet most people today, when they think of rhythm game, either think of Rock Band or think of this stuff. Patapon, what about rhythm games that are just straight up other games that just use rhythm as a driving element or as a mechanic within the game? So it's such a wide genre. DDR really stands apart from all of them. Not that it's better, as I keep saying, just that it's different and it's unique. You can and even I'm, think of like the Resident Evil like you know action uh, action things as sort of a rhythm game, right? It says press A, press A. DDR says step up, you step up. <laughs> so that was about 20 minutes of meandering. Where are we going with this? If you care about games at all, 
you need to try out all kinds of games. If you say you're a gamer and you've never even tried like Doom 2, well, what kind of gamer are you? Now, if you're a game journalist or a game designer, shame on you. I'm not saying Doom 2 is the greatest game. I'm not saying Doom 2 holds up to modern games. A lot of people hate Castlevania 2, but you at least gotta understand where all these old games came from. And, you know, look at all those mechanics I talked about. I could go on for hours about the mechanics of DDR. Yeah, a lot of people, they're only looking at a few genres, they're only looking at one kind of game, maybe only the kind of game they're interested in. It's like, DDR is getting no respect, and that's just one example of an entire genre of games that people just aren't even giving two craps about. So don't knock something until you try. Now, if you use this uh, fan art here, because there's two things in here that you should not knock until you have tried, right? Yeah, someone told you me... You look at ponies and you're like, there's no way that a My Little Pony cartoon is good. Oh, wait, yeah, it is. Someone told me... There's no way that DDR Pony. is good. Oh, wait, yeah, it is. Someone told me to play DDR. I reacted to both of them the same way. That is stupid. I'm going to play this or watch this so that I can then make fun of you. And now I'm waiting very expectantly for the new season of My Little Pony, and I still play DDR almost every day to this day. But most important, we're from the internet. All of us are from the internet here. Once you've tried something, your game has, wait, if you want to crap all over someone's game, if you understand their game, you know, if you hate, say, Heroes of New Earth, League of Legends, one of those games. The first thing the anti-hater is going to come at you with, right? We're telling you how to be a better hater. If you're hating on, if you want to hate on something, maybe, I guess, League of Legends, I pick on you, you're across the hallway, right? You come picking on League of Legends, the first thing that League of Legends guy is going to say is, have you played it? And if the answer is no, you're done. Right? So if you want to hate on DDR and say that's the stupidest thing in the world, you gotta play it first. Then hate on it.